honorable colleagues, as I have listened to this discussion, it occurs to me, I'm reminded of the fact that I have been a senator for three short years. And when people ask me, what's the best part of your job? I have to admit that we deal, we deal with issues ranging from pipelines and tanker bans and rocks in hot places to cannabis pardons to structured intervention units. We truly embrace Canada in full, and that is in, an incredible privilege. And with that in mind, I want to point your attention to something, to, to an, a measure in C-97, uh, the budget bill, and the report from the Senate Social Affairs Science and Technology Committee, and bring your attention to asylum seekers. Today at the National Finance Committee, which I attended, this measure, along with all others, was approved. Nevertheless, I wish to make my comments to go on record and provide some context for the report from Social Affairs that is before you. The changes that are in C-97, uh, Division 16 of Part 4, have been in the news a great deal. So let me assume that most of you are aware of them. In summary, they introduce a new ground for ineligibility for refugee protection if a claimant has made a claim for refugee protection in another country with which we have a data sharing uh, agreement. And these, these agreements are with the US, the UK, New Zealand, and Australia. Anyone who has made an asylum claim in any one of these countries would therefore be barred from a hearing before the Immigration and Refugee Board or the IRB. And even though this agreement covers all our Five Eyes partners, it is particularly targeted to those who are crossing ir irregularly over the US, from the U.S. into Canada. So instead of a hearing at the IRB, claimants who fall under this category will be rerouted to a process called the Pre-Removal Risk Assessment, or PRA. Lots of acronyms here. Let me take a few minutes to explain to you what PRA is and how it differs from an IRB hearing. The PRA is a risk assessment process to determine whether a person would be at risk of physical harm if they get sent back to their country of origin. To date, it has mainly been applied to asylum seekers who have been rejected by the IRB. So the PRA helps determine if someone, whether they, if that individual would still be vulnerable to risk. A good example could be a claim from an individual from Afghanistan, let's say, who may not meet the criteria of, for refugee protection, but nevertheless would be at risk if deported back to Afghanistan. The objective of this measure is, and I quote, and I quote the government, to better manage, discourage, and prevent irregular migration and to improve the efficiency of the Canadian asylum system without compromising its fairness and compassion. Fairness to Canadians who are concerned about delays and are worried about the integrity of the border, and fairness to asylum seekers so that those who cross into our border irregularly are not unfairly advantaged or disadvantaged based on where they arrive from. But as many of us have observed in the Senate, the devil is always in the details of the legislation. And as there are upsides, there are also downsides. And I'd like to use a little bit of my time to unpack these a little. I posed myself some questions as I studied this measure, and I would like to share these, quest these questions with you. So my first question was, should changes like this, which have a significant impact on people's lives and our system of asylum uh, approval, should these be buried in a budget bill? Does a budget bill allow us to exercise our due diligence as is normal under standalone legislation? Does it allow us appropriate time to study and hear from experts and stakeholders? Can we truly exercise sober second thought in this context? At pre-study at Social, we devoted precisely four hours and heard from precisely 
five witnesses. The next question I ask myself, and share it with you, is to assess the potential harm to at-risk communities, such as women fleeing domestic violence, children, and LGBTQ plus communities. As a letter from 40 women's organizations said to us, women and children could be returned to their home countries where they face violence and persecution without a proper hearing before an independent adjudicator. Deepa Matu of the Barbara Schleifer Clinic in Toronto, which is a shelter for women in Toronto with significant expertise in domestic violence, wrote in the Toronto Star in this, this last weekend, women refugees already occupy a precarious position in the global community. Gender-based persecution is the number one reason female refugee claimants seek asylum in Canada. Approximately half of these women flee to escape domestic violence when they are unable to find protection within their country. This is particularly concerning since the Trump administration has slammed the door on women seeking protection from domestic violence and gang violence. Domestic violence is a recognized ground for protection in Canada, but no longer in the United States. To be absolutely clear and factual, a U.S. federal court struck down the Trump policies as it applies to the initial interviews of asylum seekers, but not to the decision of the immigration court. It is hard for me, I think, for anyone to predict what the hurly-burly of current U.S. politics will do to women whose claims rest on domestic violence, given that President Trump has removed domestic violence as a grounds for protection. So it's a bit like you, you are allowed to go through security, but you're not allowed to get on the plane. My third question, and I think this is a serious one, is around the independence of decision-making. The IRB has been structured to be independent of political influence, political preferences, and political reach. And this is essential to retain the integrity of the system. The PRA process, in comparison, will be staffed by public servants. And much as I respect and admire public servants, they are not independent of political influence because at the end of the day, they work for a minister and a department. And in many instances, we have seen how public servants can be given direction and be influenced one way or another. Further, claimants who go through this process will also not be able to seek an appeal to the Refugee Appeal Division. Instead, they will apply to judicial review, which is a much narrower process focusing on the legalities of the decision. And claimants can be deported before the judicial review is completed. My third question concerns consistencies with past court decisions that guide our refugee system. The Supreme Court in Singh versus Canada in 1985 declared that the legal guarantees of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms applies to everyone physically present in Canada, including asylum seekers. The court also said refugees have the right to a full oral hearing of their claims before being either accepted or rejected. So the House the, at committee amended the bill to require such an oral hearing at the PRA, thus replacing the current paper review. And the government has called this an enhanced PRA. And when asked about whether this measure would bring us in line with the Supreme Court decision, Minister Blair assured us that this change satisfies the spirit of the decision. And I'm not sure I disagree with him on this, but I'm also, I'm also told by, by stakeholders that this decision will be challenged in the courts. So not everyone is convinced um, by Minister Blair's assertions that this will not be challenged. Andrew Brower of the Canadian As Association of Refugee Lawyers noted that it would be more appropriate to call these hearings at PRAR's interviews. They're not hearings, they are interviews, even when they are enhanced. 
They, be, they, they bear none of the hallmarks of what makes up for a fair tribunal hearing. Claimants and counsels are not allowed to present the case as they see fit, but they are there to respond to issues by the prior officers. They may not call witnesses, they may not cross-examine witnesses, and they have no opportunity to redirect. So it is the way I, I, I sort of translate into my non-legal mind. It's a one-way conversation. The fourth question I will ask you to consider is this. Is the government investing in two parallel systems? I believe the government when they say they are dedicated to strengthening the IRB and they have made the investments in funding for the next five years. And I hope, hope that, this, that this, and it's a lot of money, that they, this will restore the IRB that has been cash strapped for the last decade and so enable it to deal with its caseload and backlogs. But I also know that this will not happen in a nanosecond. It takes time for these changes to demonstrate impact. And if this is going to be the case, why would we simply not second IRB judges to the PRA hearings, thus creating efficiency and retaining the independence of the system? Conversely, why would we not bring the entire PRA process under the jurisdiction of the IRB, this way it would still stay independent, benefit from its knowledge and competency, but speed up the process. I was surprised to learn that in 2012, under then Minister Kenny, legislation was tabled and approved to bring the PRAR into the IRB, but this legislation was never brought into force. So there are other options that could be considered. So my question is whether this is the start to a slow deterioration and undermining of the independent adjudication system. This government or other future governments may move more and more claimants away from the board and into the new enhanced IRCC apparatus, from the mothership, so to say, to the garage. The fifth question sort of relates around to the uncertainties and the timing. Minister Blair has informed us at committee that he will hire 46 new officers, not he, the IRCC, will hire 46 new officers. They will be trained and they will be equipped with the competencies to make life-changing decisions. Again, this does not turn on a dime. The measure comes into force at royal assent. So advocates in conclusion, have raised alarms about the potential impact on women, children, and the LGBTQ plus community. The independence of the system could be at risk. A budget bill does not allow us sufficient time to examine these measures. So I'm left with the question, will this measure make us stronger and weaker? And that's a loaded value-based question, and I will ask I ask myself, which lens do I use to answer that question? And I reach back to one of my personal heroes, Mahatma Gandhi, who said, the true measure of any society is how it treats its most vulnerable people, those who are the weakest, those with no voice, and those with little personal agencies. I hope with these questions in mind, along with others you may have, you can, we can still provide a modicum of sober second thought as this particular measure is considered at third reading. As for myself, I have reluctantly, very reluctantly, accepted the fact that it is well nigh impossible to amend a budget bill. I have used other routes to create uh, enhancements and in successive meetings with Minister Blair, who has, I should state, been extremely responsive to suggestions both by the Social Affairs Committee and my own suggestions, he has incrementally enhanced the PRA process to more closely meet a higher bar. I will admit it is not perfect. I do not be believe perfection is, is in our reach. In addition, he has committed to a review, and I will quote him, the government is willing to provide the Social Affairs Committee with an update on the effectiveness of these new measures within two years. So 
Honourable colleagues, this is not the last time I hope you will hear about this, and certainly not the last time you will hear from me about this. Thank you very much. Thank you.